So how are you doing out there? Anybody hungry? Or raise a hand out there. How are you doing? You'll probably be okay. Barring other complications, even if you're hungry right now, the human body can go weeks without eating. What about anybody thirsty? You're thirsty? Don't sweat it. You got a couple of days uh, without anything to drink before you need to worry. Weeks without food, days without water. What's even more critical to sustain life? Do you, do you know? Oxygen. It's the air that we breathe. Even the healthiest among us can only survive for a matter of minutes without oxygen. So before food and water, what you really need to pay attention to is your ability to breathe. So maybe, maybe we could just do that now. Maybe we could just take a moment to, to breathe in and, and breathe out. Would you do that? Just breathe in. Just, just pay attention to, to breathing in. Breathe it out. There's a reason why so much meditation, prayer practices, just healthy uh, mindfulness starts with paying attention to your breathing. Breathing is critical to life. Even, even above food and water, breathing. Breathing in, breathing out, taking um, Taking stock of, of that is something we don't normally have to pay attention to. Our autonomic nervous system usually takes care of breathing without us consciously having to think, breathe in, now breathe out, right? Our body just regulates that. It's on autopilot, if you will. But that doesn't mean that we should take breathing for granted. We must breathe or we will die. What's true for us physically, right, this idea of respiration, what's true for us physically, I believe is equally true for us spiritually. If true, what does breathing spiritually look like? What do do I even mean by that? How do you breathe with your spirit? I hope you are not surprised to hear it looks like loving God and God loving us, right? That there's this exchange. It looks like God gifting us life, which is yet another way we might understand or, or perhaps wrap our mind around, begin to think about resurrection. We're still in this period, the season of Eastertide, where we're, we're remembering what it means to be brought back to life through Christ, this resurrection of Jesus and what it might means, mean for us. So when we talk about spiritual breathing, I hope it doesn't surprise you that we're going to connect resurrection, new life, with that gift that God gives us. If you're interested in in living a resurrected life, the the resurrection of Jesus in particular, I want you to to listen to this. In our Older Testament, the the first half of our scriptures, we have a a number of prophets. Prophets, just, just to orient us, Prophets were uh, uh, those people that generally traveled from place to place sharing the, the voice of God. Thus says the Lord, right? These are the people who would, who would show up and remind the people of, of God's commands for their lives or, or God's instructions for, for how they were to live and be together. Ezekiel, one of the prophets, the a book bears his name we have in our Old Testament. Ezekiel is a prophet of God, and he shares with us a vision. There's several, but the one I want to focus on today shares with us a vision of the life-giving power of our loving God. So maybe close your eyes if that's helpful. Pay attention to your breathing. Picture, picture Ezekiel's words that I'm going to share with us now coming to life. This is the good news as recorded in Ezekiel 37. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. 
And then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound. And the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked And tendons and flesh appeared on them and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. And then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. And we say, thanks be to God. Now, I love the stories of Jesus. But I do not understand Jesus apart from God's love as demonstrated in valleys filled with dry bones. Ezekiel says in verse 7, so I prophesied as I was commanded. Right Again, the prophet, to prophesy is to say, this is what the Lord says. Right? It's to share, share what God's intent is. I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them. But here's the the piece that I don't want us to miss. But there was no breath in them. God God said what he was going to do, right? God said, this is what's going to happen. And it happened. But Ezekiel Ezekiel gives us this clue here that, that things can look alive and still be dead. Right, the bones come together, and the tendons, and right. If you know anything about human physiology, right, this is how it's supposed to work. We're all supposed. These very dry bones are not just a little dead; they're very dead. Right, these very dry bones have come together. They've been knit back together, and and they're covered with flesh, covered over with skin. So you can imagine that they look alive. They look like they've come back to life, but there is no breath. In them. Even when the bones begin to come together, they remain lifeless. What restores the bones to life? I wonder if maybe a better question may be who? Because Ezekiel continues in, in the ninth verse Then God said to me, Prophesy to the breath. God has a has a message for the breath, right? God has an intent for the breath. Prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Thus saith the Lord, right? This is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, breath, from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied, right? I shared God's message as I had been commanded and breath entered them. They came to life, right? Then they came to life and they stood up on their feet, a vast army. You can imagine these words being spoken at a time when the people were were worried and concerned, where it seemed as if their story might have come to an end. But they're the people of God. So where is God, right? Where, where is God in our midst? And, they, and they're, they've asked, they're asking these questions. And friends, I, I, I resonate with this. I understand there should have been times in my life when I've looked around and thought, how is, this is it? This is, it's only when the bones receive God's breath, the spirit of God, that they live. 
I've spent a lot of my life, I think, trying to live without the breath of God. Looking alive, going through the motions of life, but not having the Spirit of God. The word that we use for breath is the same word that we often will translate as wind or spirit. It's ruach in the Hebrew or pneuma in the Greek. The chaos ordering, life giving spirit or wind, breath of God. I, I take a moment to recognize that these words are, are connected because we sometimes think of the spirit as a wind or, or, or we think of the spirit as, you know, kind of this, uh, you know, powerful force, you know. But I wonder if today we, we might take those ideas and, and hold them together in our minds as we also recognize this other piece, the breath of God. Genesis 1, again, back in the beginning of our scriptures, starts, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. There's this sense of, of, of chaos, right? Darkness, these waters. Water in the, in the ancient world was dangerous. It can still be dangerous, right? It was, a, it was a, a, an image of chaos, danger. But in the beginning, when there was no form, there was no order, things were empty, and there was just this chaos, the spirit, the ruach, the pneuma, the breath of God, was hovering over the waters. In the beginning, God begins to order the chaos. It's the breath of God hovering. It's the, right, it's the spirit of God that begins to do that work. And, and if you read on in Genesis, there's this order that happens to creation, and it's all born out of the, the, the mouth of God, right? God speaks it into, the breath of God makes it happen. In Genesis 2, we have a companion creation story. Right. Another way of explaining the creation. And in Genesis 2, this is added. Genesis 2, verse 7. Then the Lord God formed a man, humanity, right? Formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed, right? Breathed into his nostrils the breath, the ruach, the pneuma, the spirit of life. And the man was a living being. Before, just a pile of dust, right? A mud man, Adam, right? It's only when the breath enters that creation that it comes to life. It can look alive, but it's only when the Spirit of God enters that true life emerges. When the Spirit entered Adam, he became a living being. When the breath of God entered those flesh and bones in that valley, they were resurrected and they rose up. When Jesus is raised, right? When Jesus comes out of the tomb, it is by the power of the Holy Spirit. God's breath, God's Spirit enlivens him. And he, Jesus, sends that Spirit to us. If you, again, if you read through the, the, the stories of Christ, if you read through the resurrection stories, he says, I can't stay, I've got to go, but it's a good thing that I'm going because a spirit, the intercessor, the advocate, right, will come. It's been there all along. The spirit's been there all along, but we'll receive this spirit as a gift. This new life will be made possible if we receive it. It's, it's been hovering over us from the beginning. But most of us have been looking alive, but not, having not received that gift, we haven't been truly alive. I ask you today, will you receive the gift? Will you receive the Spirit? 
Flesh and bone came together in that valley, but they remained dead without the breath. I, I see it all the time. I can see flesh and bone driving back and forth to work. Flesh and bone dropping the kids off at practice. Flesh and bone teeing off on the par three. I could see flesh and bone walking the dog through the neighborhood. Flesh and bone waiting in line for frozen custard. Maybe flesh and bone planning a graduation party or, or flesh and bone sitting on a couch or in a chair or on a plane, perhaps even in a pew wondering about lunch or whatever else might be going on. Even in this moment, we're just flesh and bone, right? We're just, we can look alive, but are we truly alive? Bones sticking together, covered with flesh and skin, have the appearance of life, but they don't live because they ignore their neighbors and fight with their family and abuse creation squander their talents and hoard their resources. That's not living. You see, Ezekiel, this prophet, has a vision in a valley of dry bones. And that vision reminds me that we can look alive but not be alive. To become alive is to receive the gift of life, and it is a gift. There is no other life, no other way to come to life, but choosing To receive the gift is still a choice. I mean, listen to me here. We are dead. Dead in our sin. Dead as we choose to live separated from God. In all of the ways that we don't love our neighbor or don't love God, we are dead. But Jesus says there is another way. If you follow me, come and follow me. If you follow me, I will show you how to live. You could live. And if we follow Christ, if we love sacrificially as he loves, if we serve one another, if we seek to encourage and support and help everyone we can, we could live. The danger here is, friends, is thinking we could do it on our own, thinking that we have our own power and energy and and motivation to make that work. It does not work. The only way we can truly live, the way we, we can follow Christ and to do all the things that Christ does that's what Christ says, right? Follow me and, I'll, and, and you're going to do even greater things. Follow me and, and you can truly live. Follow me. And the way we're going to do that is to receive life, receive the gift of life. And the gift of life is the Holy Spirit. It's God's breath breathed over us and into us. I can imagine it. I can see it. I can see our churches coming alive, not looking alive, but being alive, right? Not just showing up on a Sunday and going through the motions and singing the songs and turning on the video. Not, not, those are good things. But I'm talking about being alive, being resurrected. I can see our churches coming alive. I can see our neighborhoods transformed. I can see the world renewed. Can you see it, friends? I can see it. So I prophesy over the bones, our dry bones. I say, thus says the Lord, receive this gift. I prophesy to the breath to come from every corner of God's creation. And I say to you and to me, live I say, dry bones, receive the breath, the wind, the spirit of the Lord, and live. Will you live? Will you receive the breath? Will you let God take up residence in your heart? Will you hear the words of Ezekiel? Will you hear the words that I speak this day? Will you see their fulfillment in Jesus, who even now sends his spirit to restore, to heal, to guide, to protect, to comfort, to resurrect us? If you would live, if you would live, pray that a fresh wind would blow through your life, through your family, through the church, through our world. 
pray that God's breath would be shared with us again. Pray with me. Just breathe in. And maybe as you breathe in, say, breathe on me. And as you breathe out, maybe you'll say, breath of God. Breathe on me. Breath of God. Breathe on me. Breath of God. Breathe on us, God. Fill us with life anew. Help us to love what you love and do what you do. In the name of Christ and by the power of the Spirit, the wind, the ruach, the pneuma, the breath, we pray. Amen.